Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for Scientists in Action, End of the Dinosaurs, Rise of the Mammals. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I am so excited to be your host and moderator for this exciting program today. If you're not familiar with Scientists in Action, this is a program in which students from all across the country and sometimes even all across the world connect with scientists where they work and get a chance to ask them real questions. It's one of my very favorite programs that we offer here at the museum, and we are so excited that even though circumstances are a little bit different, and today we're not able to be at a paleontology field site as planned, we are still able to connect with you from our homes and talk with you about the worst day in the history of planet Earth. Connected to me now are two of our paleontologists at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. I will have them start their video now. We are connected today to Dr. Tyler Leeson and to Dr. Ian Miller. Uh, they are two Hi, of our creators of paleontology, and we are so excited to have them. Ian will start his video any moment now and join us, and in just a moment, I'm gonna kick it over to them. But a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get going. I wanna say a big hello to all of the students watching with us in Zoom today. We are currently connected to almost 900 students from all across the United States and even into Canada. So a big thank you to all of you for joining us today. There are a few things that you students watching in Zoom need to know. The chat is the only way for you to communicate with us today. I will be watching the chat and uh, I will be able to take the questions that you ask there and direct them to our scientists live and on camera. So send us those questions along. I see lots of you are already saying hello, sending us messages to let us know where you're watching from today. We love that, keep that coming. Please know that we cannot see you or hear you. So don't worry about that and that I am the only one who can see those chat messages. So if you're wondering where other people's chats are, it's because you're not seeing them, just I'm seeing them. That's a way for us to keep our webinar private and secure and to protect your privacy. I also wanna say a big hello to our Facebook audience today. Hi to everybody watching on Facebook. I will be watching the stream today on my handy dandy device. So send in those questions or comments as you have them. And I will pull as many questions as I have time to ask our experts live and on camera. But without any further ado, I'm gonna stop talking because I am not the most interesting part of this event. I'm instead going to kick it over to our paleontologists and let them take it away. And I believe, Dr. Miller, you were going to start. Tell us the story of the worst day ever. Something really, really big and really, really awful happened like 66 million years ago. And it was a pretty significant event. So what happened? Yeah, so I, I'm so excited to be here and I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna show you guys a few slides. And Tyler and I are gonna take you through this incredible, incredible story. So can you guys see my first slide here? I can see it. Looks like we need to go full screen, but that is all right. There we go. Okay, awesome. So what you guys are seeing here is what you can think of as the last day of the time of the dinosaurs. Here's a, a, a artist reconstruction that Tyler and I create with an artist out of Russia uh, that we work with all the time of what Colorado might have looked like. And in this case, the Hell Creek Formation, which is nearby here, just a little bit further north, would have looked like 66 million years ago. An incredibly vibrant ecosystem, uh, unbelievable diversity of plants and animals, and in particular, dinosaurs, all kinds of feathered dinosaurs. So there's a T-Rex in the background feeding on some kind of critter and a, a, um, along a river and a feathered dinosaur there in the foreground and some turtles, Tyler's favorite animal, uh, walking through uh, what are actually fossil hops from this time period. But there's this incredible event that changed the course of life. So 66 million years ago, here are the dinosaurs going about their merry life and were hit by a giant space rock moving at about 150,000 miles an hour. It's moving so fast that it pulls outer space right to the planet. Uh, right to the surface of the forest. And it blows a hole in the ground about um, 120 miles across and about 20 miles deep in a second. And this thing is um, about 10 miles across this space rock. And it sends a shock wave and firestorm from where it hit in Mexico all the way to Alaska in five minutes. So you really did not want to be in the path of that blast. So that's the initial effect, just this huge shock wave and firestorm. And here's a poor Tyrannosaurus and, and, uh, and Triceratops um, fighting in the, in the blast wave. I don't know why they're still fighting here. They probably should be more worried about that firestorm coming up than they are uh, still fighting here. So that's the initial effect. But just alongside that, we had huge um, tidal waves. We think tidal waves may have actually made it from Mexico all the way 
to North Dakota in the first few hours. There's huge earthquakes. All this material gets blasted back out into space and comes raining back to Earth and causes a huge thermal pull, which Tyler will show you some evidence of that here in a minute. Um, but this incredible event uh, leads to uh, what we would term a nuclear winter. Uh, so the sun is blotted out, ecosystems collapse, and dinosaurs go extinct. So here maybe is a few years after the asteroid impact and all the big giant dinosaurs have gone. But how do we know this? What, what's the evidence to tell us that life, that this event happened and that life was completely redirected 66 million years ago? And so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Tyler Leeson, to tell you a little bit about the evidence and how we know this actually happened. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Hi everyone. Okay, I'm going to start sharing my screen. I will say we did get a lot of reactions in the chat to the effect of whoa and even the emoji that's like what? So excellent it storytelling is so there. Cool, right? I mean, this is the worst single day for life on Earth. It is just such a an amazing thing. And Ian just told this wonderful story of what happened on the the single worst uh, day for life on Earth. But how do we really know? Like, what is the scientific evidence that, uh, you know, so that tells us that this is actually what happened? Uh, well, for starters, uh, there are places around the world, including where I grew up in southwestern North Dakota and eastern Montana, as well as right here in Colorado, that preserve the Earth's last dinosaur ecosystem. Uh, and here, here in Colorado, and again, where I grew up, you can find numerous dinosaurs uh, in these rocks, all the way going, all the way up to a line, literally a line in the sand. And above that line, you no longer find any more dinosaurs. So the age of the dinosaurs is down here, and then they very suddenly go extinct. So that tells us that this must have that this extinction must have happened very, very quickly. Here, my team and I are collecting this very large um, uh, uh, Triceratops skull. If this thing is so big. Here's me for scale. You can maybe see a horn sticking out right here. There's another horn right here. The big shield of the Triceratops um, is, is back here. This is just the skull of a Triceratops um, that's six and a half feet long. Uh, one of the biggest fossils that I've, I've ever found. Truly incredible. It's so big that you can see it from Google Earth. If you go on to Google Earth, you can see this little log looking like structure right here. That is this Triceratops skull over here. Uh, absolutely amazing. So my team and I, we've been working this area, and Ian mentioned that it's called the Hell Creek Formation for many, many years, finding lots of uh, dinosaurs and turtles and crocodiles and plants, trying to build up the story of, of what happened. And so we find the Earth's last dinosaurs. And in fact, we found a couple of years ago, the geologically, the youngest dinosaur ever found. It was found five centimeters or two inches below uh, the KT boundary. Um, absolutely amazing. So this brings us to our very first poll question. Uh, what, do you, you know, what do you think is in this plaster jacket right here? What is the geologically the youngest dinosaur ever found. That's right. So in just a moment, you are going to see a poll pop up on your screen that is going to ask you to vote. What do you think was the youngest dinosaur ever found? What was the last one found beneath that KT boundary, that line in the soil? So go ahead and cast your vote. I do see some students letting us know that they are not able to see your screen, Tyler. So could you perhaps, while we're doing the poll, stop your share and then start it again. That might fix the issue. And as a reminder to our students, this program is being recorded and we will be able to distribute a recording to all of you later. So don't worry if you missed some pieces of it, it's all right. Your teacher's gonna get a link to a recording a little bit later and you'll be able to watch it back. I see we have a lot of votes coming in. Oh my goodness, we're gonna leave this poll up for another few moments or so. So cast those votes. If you haven't voted yet, we would love to know. Was it a Spinosaurus that was found just below the KT boundary? Was it a Triceratops, a Stegosaurus, or a Parasaurolophus? Uh, let us know what you think. 
some students are letting me know that they can't see the poll and that's okay guys it's a there are a lot of people in this webinar it looks like we have just about a thousand students with us right now so if you can't see it go ahead and type that answer in the chat and we will reveal that answer anyway all right we're going to end that poll Looks, Tyler, like most of our students have voted for Paris or Alophis, but we also have votes for all of the other candidates. So let us know, what was it? What did we find? Those are, that's a, that's a, a good guess. Para, Paris or Alophis was found uh, just before the extinction, maybe about 10 million years before the extinction. So the big reveal, the last dinosaur was a Triceratops. Uh, that's an amazing dinosaur. Uh, we found the jawbone that you can see here from this triceratops. Again, just mere uh, inches below uh, the boundary. Uh, uh, tr truly, truly incredible. So this is all great, right? I mean, so now we know, what do we know? We know that there were as a dinosaur ecosystem that was thriving, and then that dinosaur ecosystem goes extinct very suddenly. I mean, there were a lot of ideas that tried to explain this of what caused the extinction of the dinosaur. Was it changes in climate, changes in sea, uh, sea level? Uh, there were giant volcanoes going off in India right around when dinosaurs go extinct. Maybe that played a role. Uh, was it a widespread disease? Um, so there were a lot of ideas that tried to explain the extinction of the dinosaur. And then in 1980, a group of scientists from the University of California in Berkeley um, they were analyzing the, the KT boundary, that's this line right here, and they were looking at a different set of questions. Um, but when they started analyzing the, the elements of, of, of the rocks above and below, they were shocked to find that this layer right here, the KT boundary, was super enriched with the iridium. Now, iridium is super rare on Earth, but it's really, really common in uh, meteorites, in asteroids. So they hypothesized that maybe it was a meteorite that caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. And they looked uh, at samples around the world and they noticed that this, uh, what we call an iridium anomaly, or just a lot of iridium, occurs uh, right at when dinosaurs go extinct. This was met with a lot of criticism by a lot of different scientists at the time in the early 1980s. And they said, well, look, if it was a giant rock from space that killed the dinosaurs, where's the crater? Where's the hole in the ground? I mean, we need, we need, to, you know, we need to see that. Uh, and that, that, that piece of evidence was found in the 1990s. They actually found the crater uh, from right at the same time when dinosaurs go extinct. And it was discovered uh, right off the Yucatan Peninsula here in the Gulf of Mexico. So here's Florida right here. Um, and they, they found this 120 mile wide uh, uh, crater. Um, it was found near the, the town of Chicxulub, uh, Mexico. And so they have named this crater the Chicxulub uh, Crater. Um, and on the perimeter of this crater, there are a bunch of these cenotes or sinkholes that, that line um, the, the perimeter of this, of this crater. So now we have the crater. One of the coolest pieces of evidence, uh, I think, for this hypothesis is that when the asteroid struck off the Yucatan Peninsula, it sent up this giant uh, debris field into the atmosphere. So the big rock hits, hits Earth, sends this stuff up into the atmosphere, and of course what goes up must eventually come down. And it comes down with a vengeance. Here we have these little molten beads of death uh, raining down on the planet, setting the planet on fire. Uh, truly, truly incredible. And we find these little, these little raindrops of death uh, all over the, the world. This is a, a sample that I collected just north of here in uh, Wyoming. So if we have any visitor or anybody on, the, on, with, on, us, on with us today from Wyoming, um, you have evidence in your state for this mass extinction. And here you can see these little, these little raindrops, little raindrops of death. They're just so cool. Again, this is parts of Mexico and the Gulf Coast that got hit by the asteroid, sent up into the atmosphere, and then rained back down around the globe. So incredibly cool. So these are just a few lines of evidence that suggest it was the asteroid or that an asteroid struck Earth. A lot of iridium. Uh, uh, we have the crater, 
And then we have uh, these little black, you know, these little beads of death found around the world. But some things did survive, right? Obviously, we're here talking today. So some things survived this mass extinction event. So that brings us to our next uh, poll question, which is what was the largest animal to survive this mass extinction event? That's right. So you're going to see another poll popping up on your screen. And students, one suggestion I do have, if you could not see that poll the first time, I suggest opening the chat for some reason, whatever. If you have that chat open on your screen, that does help you see the poll. And Facebook audience, feel free to let us know what you think in the comments as well. So what was the largest animal to survive the asteroid impact? Was it a mammal? Was it a fish? Was it a turtle? How about a crocodile? See a lot of comments coming in the chat as well. So remember, you can share what you think in the chat and see what happened or think what, excuse me, share what you think happened in the chat. But I see lots of votes coming in in the poll as well. Thanks for sharing those answers, everybody. We'll leave this open for another few moments or so. Answers saying mammals. I see some answers saying crocodile, turtles, even some turtle emoji. Tyler, I think you have some fellow turtle fans in our <laughs> call today. That is fantastic. One Tyler works on a lot. So did you know you can become a paleontologist to study turtles? I didn't until I met Tyler. All right, let's take a look at the results of that poll. It looks like most of our students have voted for mammals, but we did get some votes in every single category. And I see a, a couple of folks on Facebook have said maybe two. So maybe it was a fish. What was it, Tyler? That, those are all, all good, good answers. And the answer is, it was a giant turtle. Of course, I love turtles, so I had to put this in here. Um, the largest a mammal to survive the mass extinction is right here. That's about, it's the size of a rat. It's an incredibly small animal. So the largest mammal is the size of a rat. Here's the largest animal, this giant majestic looking turtle um, called Exestamine. And it was in fact, the largest animal that survived this mass extinction. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, Ian's going to tell you about another big discovery. I think before we do that, I should, we should take some questions from our audience. I've seen lots of questions come in. So Facebook audience, you are welcome to leave us some comments as well. Um, I am watching and we'll be ready to pull those comments to share with our scientists. But for now, I do see lots of questions that have come in from our students. Um, I saw multiple questions wondering, were dinosaur ecosystems really similar to the ecosystems of today or maybe similar to ecosystems elsewhere on the planet? Can you tell us a little bit of, about what that world was like? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take this question. And this is, this is um, a question that Tyler and I would work on all the time. We really wanna know what those ecosystems in the time of the dinosaurs were like. And we're always looking for modern ecosystems that we can compare those ancient ecosystems to. So, First, to figure out what those ancient ecosystems are, we collect a lot of fossils, a lot of different kinds of fossils, not only animals, but also the plants. Try to put that world back together with little bits of fossil evidence. And what we've been able to find is that those ecosystems um, are probably different than anything that lives on Earth today, but there's lots of similarities. They're pretty warm, they're pretty subtropical, or sometimes even tropical. And so a dinosaur ecosystem here in Colorado, right before the asteroid hit, would have been sort of like Costa Rica or Panama or something like that. Not quite the Amazon, not quite a full rainforest, but getting pretty close. So dense forest, very warm, lots of palm trees, um, and something that you might see in what we would call the subtrop. It is kind of astounding to me. I've lived in Colorado almost my entire life, and it is kind of amazing to me to think that the climate here used to be so different from how it is today. And I know that we have students from watching all, who are watching from all over the country. So perhaps your ecosystem today is a little bit more similar to how Colorado was a long, long time ago. Thanks for that answer, Ian. Uh, let's see, I've seen some other questions. Oh, did the asteroid impact affect carnivore and herbivore dinosaurs differently? A lot of folks wondered that one. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um... Well, on the one hand, I would say it, it did in the sense that uh, the, the impact initially what we think happened is that uh, it sends up a dust cloud into the atmosphere that blocked the sun. Without sunlight, the plants go extinct. Without the plants, the herbivores go extinct. And without the herbivores, the median dinosaurs go extinct. Um, so I guess maybe the chain reaction's a little bit different, uh, but the bottom line is, is, is that all uh, large dinosaurs do in fact uh, go extinct in that exact moment. 
So it sounds like kind of like in ecosystems that still exist, when something like that changes that's really big, it has sort of a chain reaction, right? So it maybe affects some species first, but then since every member of an ecosystem is connected to each other, there's sort of a chain reaction that leads to all of those members being affected. Interesting. It's funny, paleontology and modern ecology, not all that different. Great question, great answer. Um, ooh, I have seen a lot of questions coming in about the relationship between birds and dinosaurs. And I do see several people who are also wondering, so did any dinosaurs survive? Are there any forms of dinosaurs left today? So what can you tell us about that relationship? Yeah, that's, that is a, a fantastic point. Um, because of course, dinosaurs are still with us today in the form of birds. Birds are the living descendants of dinosaurs. Um, if you think about a, a, you know, a lot of these meat-eating dinosaurs and a bird, there are an awful lot of similarity. Uh, a lot, they both have feathers. They both have a wishbone here. Their bones are hollow. So there's a lot of features that, that unite the two. Um, so that's why you may have noticed in my previous response, I said all the large dinosaurs or non-avian dinosaurs go extinct. Um, but somebody caught me, which is very, very good. And um, so it's all the, the, uh, the birds, they do in fact survive and they are thriving today. In fact, there are over 10,000 species of birds uh, or dinosaurs with us today. That's great. I know our curator of ornithology, Dr. Garth Spellman, loves to say that his favorite dinosaur is a white-breasted nuthatch. So yeah. <laughs> uh, you, could, you could ask a lot of different people what their favorite dinosaur is, and their answer might differ depending on whether they focus more on the extinct dinosaurs or the ones that are still alive. And maybe if you're having chicken for dinner tonight, you can say, hey, I ate dinosaur today. That's pretty Absolutely. cool. Absolutely. Um, to that same end, I do see a lot of people wondering, are crocodiles dinosaurs or are they, they look similar or they certainly have some similar characteristics, but are they dinosaurs? Are crocodiles dinosaurs? Uh, no, they're not. They are closely related, uh, but birds are more closely related to dinosaurs than crocodiles are. So among living animals, uh, birds and crocodiles are closer related to one another, and then dinosaurs are, are are higher up in the tree, more closely related to birds than they are to uh, crocodiles. But it is kind of amazing to think that crocodiles and some other species too, like turtles and like sharks, have been on this planet for millions and millions of years. So even though yeah, they're not fact, dinosaurs, they lived with them. They lived with them, and then and then once dinosaurs went extinct, they really thrived in the aftermath. That's right. The, the winners of that extinction event. Yes, they are. One more question, and I'm going to direct this one to Ian because you are the one that coined the phrase raindrop of death. We got a lot of questions and a lot of what when you said raindrops of death. Um, what are they made of and how are they formed? I think a lot of people were curious about how that actually happened. Yeah, so the asteroid hits um, the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico with so much force that it blows this hole in the ground 120 miles across and 20 miles deep. And some of that material is still like in the form of chunks of rock and that kind of stuff and it's blasted out of the hole, but some of it's even melted and vaporized and sent into the atmosphere. And in fact, that plume of rock, we think made it about halfway to the moon uh, when it was blown out of that hole. But lots of it um, within about a day, about 24 hours started to rain back to earth. So it gets blown out of that hole and gets up into the, way up into the atmosphere, into suborbit. So think way up near sort of where the satellites are, not quite as high, but close. And then it starts coming, raining back to Earth. And think about what happens when things come back into the atmosphere. You've seen shooting stars and that kind of stuff. It was, there's so much friction. Those things are moving so fast. There's so much friction from our atmosphere, they melt. And so all of a sudden, you, so imagine this, you have this asteroid impact and it causes all these things, the shock wave, and there's actually a firestorm moving with that shock wave in those first few minutes, there's tidal waves and earthquakes. Okay, so all that happens and you're like, whew, we made it, right? We made it through all that stuff. And a no, day didn't. later, <laughs> it starts coming back in from the atmosphere. And so about 24 hours later, it starts raining molten rock everywhere on earth. And so if you were lucky and you're on the other side of the planet, you're all the way in New Zealand and you're like, man, I'm a long ways away from the impact. I did okay. But a day later, it starts raining this molten rock. And they're little tiny beads, they're like the size of BBs or something like that. And the layer is about an inch or an inch and a half thick, but it superheats. We think it superheated the atmosphere when it came back in. 
and it got the atmosphere. So if you're outside and this stuff's raining around you, it was about the temperature it takes to bake cook about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. That's oh not goodness. good. That is not good. So if you're if you're out there in that in that temperature, you would have would have had to have freeze that air. Um, and we think that lasted for about um, a couple of hours. And so if you didn't, uh, you know, if you're a big animal on the surface, that would have been really, really bad. We call it the thermal pulse. It was caused by this rain of molten rock the day after the impact. Wow, yeah, the next time I'm bummed that it's raining when I wanna be outside swimming or having a picnic, I'm just gonna be happy that it's not raining molten rock. And I think my favorite comment that I've seen come in in the chat is from a student saying, wow, you thought you survived and then you didn't. That's a disappointment. Yes, that's right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> An extreme disappointment. One more quick question before we move on. I did see one come in on our Facebook stream. Heather is wondering how big was that turtle, Tyler, that was the largest animal to survive that extinction? And I did see some students wonder, so was that like the size of a Galapagos tortoise or how big was it? Yeah, I think that's a, a pretty apt uh, comparison. This thing wasn't like a Galapagos tortoise, wasn't living on land. It was living in the water, which likely helped it survive. But it ha its a shell, the top shell was about three and a half, three to three and a half feet uh, uh, wide. And it weighed a couple hundred pounds. Um, and there are modern uh, turtles like this still living with us today. So the giant river turtle in the Yangtze uh, River in China. So you can Google that and you'll find these images of these giant turtles um, being hauled up uh, uh, onto land. And again, they're about three feet, three feet across. So really, really big. Yeah, so it sounds like students, that is your Google search of the day is giant turtle. That's your homework today <laughs> is go and Google that. All right, well, I think there's still one big question that I know we have and that I've seen some students in the chat time in with. And Ian, I think you can be the one to talk about it. What happened next? Like we know that there's still life on earth. We're all here. There are still ecosystems and tons of species. So how did the earth come back from this huge and terrible event to become what it is today? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so right, we, we, I'm gonna share my screen again. So you guys have, a, uh, I'm gonna show you a few slides. Whoops, sorry about that. Go, there we go. So today we know there's amazing diversity of things on the planet. So here's just a slide showing you some of those things, the, um, all the insects, fish, the mammal diversity, of course, the birds that Tyler talked about, all the incredible plants and all kinds of things like fungi and bacteria and that kind of stuff. All of those things had to have ancestors that survived this event. So just imagine that when you look outside and you look at the plants and the animals, everything that's alive today had an ancestor that survived this incredible, devastating event 66 million years ago. And one of the big questions is who survived, why they survived, what it looked like, how the world came back. So this is one of the, the questions that Tyler and I are very, very interested in, and we've spent a lot of time working on it. So right after the impact in the thousands or tens of thousands of years afterwards, we look for things like this. Here are two little tiny pieces of jaw of uh, um, a tiny mammal that gives us some of that evidence. And in fact, this was mostly what we had before about a couple of years ago. So for a hundred years, paleontologists have been interested in this. They've been looking at all the rocks of the right age, or those rocks right above that layer, trying to figure out who survived, why they survived, and who they were. So this was a big open question that a lot of people were working on. And Tyler and I um, were very fortunate a couple of years ago to make an incredible discovery right here in Colorado. So this is a picture of a place called Corral Bluffs, and you're looking towards the west, and there in the rain in the distance is Pikes Peak. So there's actually Colorado Springs, just over that low ridge before the mountain, the city over there of Colorado Springs. And at this spot, these rocks are of the right age. So at the very bottom of the hill is the KT boundary, that layer below which there are dinosaurs and above which there are none. And uh, so we went to these rocks to see if we can uh, find some cool fossils here. And people have found some fossils before to tell this story, but they hadn't really sort of cracked the code to find an incredible diversity of fossils. And uh, we were very fortunate to use a new search image that Tyler developed to look for fossils inside of country. And it turned out there was an 
incredible diversity of fossils just laying there on the surface in plain sight, but hidden in these funny rocks called Cretia. And here's just a picture of some of the vertebrates. You can see turtle shells, a turtle skull right here in the middle. That's a turtle skull there. Tyler always tells me that looks like Darth Vader, right? And uh, the rest of those things are, uh, for the most part, mammals. There's a crocodile over here, and here's another giant mammal. And these really helped us piece together what life survived and how it came back. And we um, uh, talked, we published this about six months ago, and I'm gonna just tell you a little bit about it. Um, alongside those animals, we had incredible plants. Here's a fern uh, that lives on the volcanoes of Hawaii today and is living in uh, here in Colorado uh, 60, 65 million years ago, about the time um, just after the dinosaurs. So using these fossils, we're able to to put together this story, building on other people's work and adding our new work of how the world came back. So there, after the extinction, one of the things um, that Tyler already talked about was that there are a few small mammals, these rat-sized animals to make it through, and then this giant critter, Axistemis, this huge three foot long turtle. Um, and here's our reconstruction of Colorado Springs with the proto Rocky Mountains in the distance. And this world was dominated by ferns. So ferns really do well in disaster situations. So when Mount St. Helens blew up, uh, the first plants that came back were ferns and they were everywhere. And we see that on a global scale after the extinction of the dinosaurs and the asteroid impact. We call it the fern spore spike because what we do is take a little chunk of rock and we dissolve it and we find this full of fern spores. And so the whole world was covered in ferns for a period of time. And these few animals that survived um, began to evolve in that world. Following that, the plants began to diversify as did the animals and the mammals really got their chance. So those mammals, which lived alongside the dinosaurs, they survived the impact and then begin to diversify into all kinds of... Um... And so this... Uh, Next world that we reconstructed here uh, has two of those new mammals on the landscape, a turtle in the, in the foreground, a crocodile in this muddy water. And we call this the pecan pie world because walnuts started to evolve and pecans are part of the walnut family. And, and uh, Tyler loves this idea, as do I, that this was the world dominated uh, by the walnuts. And here are actually some walnut flowers hanging from this tree with the walnut leaves. So we call this the pecan pie world as this world came back. This is about 200, 300,000 years. And then I'm gonna take you to about 700,000 years after the extinction as this world rebounded. And I wanna tell you a cool story. And here we are working on this project and we work with a lot of uh, young uh, scientists. We call them the teen science scholars. This is Aeon Way Smith. And she was working with me uh, in a plant quarry. We're digging fossil plants. And we actually have a Nova special about this. And so the film crews were there when we we're working on this. And if you watch a Nova special called Rise of the Mammals, you'll see this story play out on camera. And we were talking about the kinds of fossils we we're finding. And Aeon was digging away. She literally on camera, she's handing me the fossil right here of the world's oldest legume. Legumes are a super important uh, group of plants today. They're second only to grains and cereals terms of a food source, and you're looking at a bean pod right here. And there are about 20,000 species of beans on Earth today, and we think they evolved right at this moment. And Aeon, she was 14 or 15 at the time, she found the world's oldest legume pod, the oldest bean pod anywhere on Earth, right here in Colorado. So this allowed us to sort of put together that final world. The animals had gotten much larger. We knew that from the bones that Tyler was finding and we were finding the plant alongside them. We think that the, these new legumes on the landscape were like little protein bars, the uh, diversifying uh, mammals that were getting much, much larger. So you can see all the bean pods hanging there in the distance, these new mammals on the landscape. Uh, the big one here in the front is uh, eating a little palm seed. You can see all the legumes around here. And this guy over here, this like a big rodent, he's eating a bean pod uh, or she's eating a bean pod on the edge of that stream. And so um, with this discovery in Colorado Springs, we're able to, to paint this picture of, of how the world came back. First as ferns and a few animals that made it through. Those gave rise to a whole new group of animals and new plants. 
which finally culminated in this about 700,000 years ago. And these critters are the ancestors uh, to everything that lives today. Um, and so this is how our world came back from that incredible asteroid event wiped out. So I think with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it back over to Holly. Yeah, thank you for that incredible explanation. I think sometimes, you know, a lot of us who are paleontology enthusiasts are like dinosaurs, 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 right? When I was a kid, I loved dinosaurs. And it's taken me a little while as I've grown up and I've learned more about paleontology to really get into things like mammals and plants and other types of species that have evolved throughout these millions of years and billions of years that Earth has existed. And I think the really important thing to keep in mind here, everybody, is that those mammals gave rise to us, right? Those, those mammals are our ancestors. And that's why it's important for us to talk about these things because man, we wouldn't be here without that horrible asteroid extinction. So that terrible day led to some pretty cool things. I see lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to take some of those from the chat. And I do also see a couple comments on the Facebook stream. Sarah says that this whole thing has really increased her respect for ferns. So I agree, I agree with that as well. And I think a lot of the students, perhaps you're gonna have some legumes with your dinner this evening. So the next time you eat a big bowl of green beans, you might think a little bit differently about those now that you've learned this. All right, let's jump back into some questions. And Ian, I think you're gonna love this one. We got some questions wondering, how did the extinction event affect plants? Nice, yes, <laughs> that is, <laughs> that's basically all I think about. So, um, so I, I'm thrilled. Whoever that was, if you wanna come work for me, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have you. There you so, go. Ask um, Ian questions about plants and he'll love you forever. Um, it affected plants a lot. And we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how it affected plants. We know that about 60 to 70% of plant species go extinct. So they're not safe from the asteroid impact. Many, many different types of plants go extinct. And a couple of the patterns that we see are that plants that were wind pollinated probably did better than, insect, than plants that were insect pollinated because all their pollinators, all the insects were gone. So if they relied on an insect to pollinate them, that was, they were in trouble. Another big pattern we see is that deciduous plants did better than evergreen plants. So if you could lose your leaves in the fall, um, you survived better than those plants that couldn't lose their leaves. So you can imagine a world in which, you know, you have an asteroid impact and then the sun is blotted out like Tyler was talking about for a period of months to years, you could drop your leaves and go dormant and then come back when the sun reemerged, you would survive. If you couldn't do that, you might go extinct. So those are two big um, filters, ecological filters, two reasons why plants have gone extinct. That makes a lot of sense. And it's, been, it's really interesting how plants have some very different survival strategies than animals can have because they just are equipped with some different adaptations. Um, I've seen some, some similar questions as well talking about, you know, why did this extinction event impact some species but not others? And I do see a question and maybe Tyler, you can take this one. Um, how were sea animals impacted? So animals that lived in the water, was, was the effect on them a little bit different? Yeah, we, you know, in the, in the ocean, we know there was a mass extinction, but that extinction did play itself out uh, a little bit differently. I and mean, some of the mechanisms for the extinction were, were different. Um, some of the things that we see are the big plesiosaurs, like the big Loch Ness monster-like animals that uh, aren't related to dinosaurs. They're more closely related to lizards, in fact. Uh, but those big sea uh, monsters uh, go extinct at this interval of time. The things that they were eating went extinct as well. The, the cool, coiled, shelled animals, the invertebrates, the ammonites, um, they're common in museums. So a lot of folks here may, may have seen those in, in museums. They go extinct. Um, and we think what happened is that when the asteroid struck, it sent stuff into the atmosphere, it came back down. And what happened in the oceans is, is that for, it basically turned uh, the oceans into uh, a vats of acid. Uh, it acidified the ocean um, for a period of time. And when you change the pH like that and, uh, in the oceans, what happens is that it, it kills all of the, the four Ms and all of the sort of the base of that ecosystem chain. It's like we were talking about before. If you knock out the base of the ecosystem, the plants on land or the forams uh, and other uh, small creatures in the ocean, then that has the ripple effects up. 
to the things that rely on the forearms, they go extinct and then it, it just ripples through the ecosystem. So the oceans, we do see uh, you know, mass devastation at the uh, KT boundary. Yeah, mass devastation is uh, one way of saying that. Sounds like a very light, very lighthearted description of what happened there. Um, awesome. Let's jump forward in time a little bit because I do see some more questions related to Corral Bluff and things that came after this extinction event. Um, I do see one on the Facebook stream from Sarah saying, so was evolution at the time of Corral Bluff, so in the, in the years immediately following the asteroid impact, faster? Was it occurring at a faster rate than at other times in Earth's history? Or do we even know? Most likely. Yeah, because what, what happens is you get these uh, bottleneck effects. You know, you have a lot of landscape, animals on the landscape, and then all of a sudden you have this tree pruning event, giant asteroid in this case. And only certain things survive. You have low population sizes. And so with the low population size, you can get uh, uh, you know, what we call these, these bottlenecking uh, effects, um, which can, can increase the rates of, of evolution. The other, I think, more important thing is, is that it just sort of wipes the slate clean, this mass extinction event. And by doing that, it opens up all of these ecological niches. And so then it's just sort of a, a race amongst all the different groups of animals of who can fill those niches, uh, those, the, the, the niche space, the, the fastest. And so because of that, um, the, the rates of evolution do seem to, to pick up. And there have been numerous studies on, on different groups uh, that have shown that. That's a great question. Yeah, it really is. And you know, if there's no competition and then you have resources in the form of delicious pecans and walnuts, I want <laughs> pie now, Ian. So if I just eat pie for the rest of the day, I'm, I'm blaming you for that. Um, if you have all of these great resources that can give you some good calories, you can evolve really quickly. Great question. Thank you for that. Um, moving forward in time a little bit, I do see some questions now about the ice age, actually. Uh, I think people are wondering, wait, so was the Ice Age around this time? When did the Ice Age happen? That was also a period of big change. And Ian, I'm gonna direct that question to you because I know you were involved and maybe Tyler, you were as well. I don't know if this was before your time or not with the big snow mass dig uh, several years ago. So Ian, can you tell us a little bit about the Ice Age? Yeah, so the Ice Age was in some ways the, the biggest and most recent um, climatic uh, event in, in Earth's history. And we're actually still in the ice age. Uh, we go through what we call glacial and interglacial events. So the glaciers advance and retreat. And this has been happening for about 3 million years. And we're in what we call an interglacial, a period between um, uh, glaciers. And the, the idea is, is that uh, if, if carbon in the atmosphere gets low enough, that changes in our orbit around the sun can allow ice to grow and to shrink. But carbon has gotten so high in our atmosphere that we're probably out of that cycle. We're probably not going to go into a glacial period, even though we still have the changes in our orbit. Uh, we just have a warmer blanket around the Earth, and we just can't get that cold again. Turn the clock all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs. There's no ice. Uh, there's really no ice anywhere on the planet. In fact, Antarctica was an incredible forest. It was still at the location that it is today. Uh, so the South Pole was there, and it was a forest from the edge all the way to the middle. So the most recent ice age, how did, it, how did it help the Earth recover? It doesn't play a role in that so much. The Earth had recovered long before the current ice age. It's just that the current ice age is a, a time of change unto itself. So we have all kinds of amazing animals evolve and go extinct um, over the last three million years. Think of um, mammoths and mastodons and giant sloths um, and huge beavers and, and flathead peccaries and giant condors. The list goes on and on and on. And of course, us. So human, uh, humankind evolved during the last ice age. We have many, many ancestors and cousins uh, that either gave rise to us or went extinct during the last ice age. So the last ice age was extremely important in evolution, but doesn't really play into this story of extinction and recovery. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It was pretty recent. And if you look at ice age fossils, you might actually recognize some animals that are still alive today, just maybe in a slightly different form. We are right at 11.45, which is supposed to be the end of our time, but I do have one last one that I would like you both to give a quick answer to. I've seen some people ask this question, and so I want to know, too, what advice do you have for anyone watching today, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's in Zoom, who wants to grow up to be a paleontologist? Tyler, will you start for us? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think for starters is just to, to get outside and to sort of go and look for fossils and make your own discoveries, not necessarily fossils, but just go outside and, and uh, into the natural world. There's a lot of cool things in this natural world. Uh, and, you know, like we've shown here, there's a lot of great discoveries to be made, you know, locally. A lot of times we think of that you know, these big discoveries are going to be happening elsewhere and other places, not my own backyard, but that's just not true. There are so many amazing discoveries to be made here. Uh, no, really, no matter where, you, where you're living or where, where you're watching us from, uh, there are great discoveries to be made. So I would say it's start there. Um, maybe I'll let Ian talk more about uh, school and, and, and those, that aspect, but uh, get outside and uh, in, into nature is my, my advice. I love that. I couldn't agree more. The only thing I'd really add is just read a lot. You know, there are so many wonderful things out there to read and wonderful books and wonderful resources on the internet. Read, 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 read. Just start building that uh, knowledge base. And Tyler and I spent a lot of time reading about paleontology. We still do it today and started very young. So read a lot. Very good. Solid advice, everybody. You heard it here from the experts. If you want to be a paleontologist when you grow up, get outside. Tyler's a living case of that because he started finding fossils in his backyard in North Dakota when he was a lot younger, even like your age, everybody. And of course, we've got a lot of time on our hands right now. So what a time. Go ahead and Google those things that you're curious about and get started with some research. All right, everybody, that is all the time that we have. Students, thank you for your questions. I wish that we could answer them all, but we are unfortunately limited in the amount of time that we have. So we have to sign off. It was amazing to have you on. Oh, and I do see a comment from Sarah saying, Tyler was also digging up dinos as a kid, not just turtles. That's right. Um, <laughs> yes, Tyler. A little the bit first of fossil was a dinosaur. I just moved over to turtles later. <laughs> there you go. So get outside and start digging, everybody. You never know what you might find. Thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. It was great to hear your questions. It was great to have your insights and to connect with so many of you from all across the country from right here at my kitchen table. So uh, stay active, stay curious, stay healthy. We'll see you next time. Teachers and students, you can look for more resources at dmns.org learn, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Right. Goodbye, guys. Bye, Thank you.